Hi everybody, my name is Sam. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, have you ever wondered what happens when master storytellers step outside of their comfort zone? Well, today I want to talk you through a couple of books I've read recently where they did exactly that. In fact, two absolute juggernauts of genre fiction decided to swap genres. Stephen King and Joan Nesbo both took a leap into new territories with King's Mr. Mercedes trilogy and Joan Nesbo's The Night House. Now I know the first Miss Mercedes book came out a while ago, but I found myself reading both of these for the first time very recently and had a really good time, but I found it an interesting experience. So how did these genre shifts fare and what elements of their writing carried over into this new style? Let's find out. So kicking off with Stephen King, often hailed as the master of horror. He's written over 60 books and many of them have haunted our dreams and our screams. Now you might be thinking he isn't always a horror writer and you're correct. Things like the Dark Tower series bring in a bit of fantasy and that one where he went back in time to try and save President Kennedy is absolutely a bit of sci-fi. But the man is traditionally a horror writer. In fact, I picked up this book, Mr. Mercedes, from Waterstone's bookstore. Now this is a classic crime thriller, but it was kept upstairs in the horror section along with the rest of the Stephen King books because he's almost typecast in that kind of genre. Meanwhile, Joe Nesbo absolutely dominates the crime thriller scene in Norway and beyond particularly for his Harry Hole detective series, though I don't think I've actually read anything by him before this book. Well, I was pleasantly surprised by both, but in different ways. Now, Mr. Mercedes is the first of the Mr. Mercedes trilogy. It's followed up by Finders Keepers and later on by Holly. In this book, we're introduced to the retired detective Bill Hodges, who is tormented by that one case that got away, the case of Mr. Mercedes a mass murderer who drove into a crowded job fair in a stolen Mercedes, plowing people down and taking many lives with him. He then fled the scene without being captured. Now this book kicks off with the killer reaching out to Bill Hodges to almost mock him for never being able to take him down. And that's when our story kicks off. Unlike King's typical fare, there's no supernatural elements here, just the real life horror of human evil. Though King's flair for deep character exploration and a vividly painted American small town do remain intact and that's what really keeps you pulled into the story. Throughout this story we meet characters who alongside Bill Hodges will stay with us through the rest of the trilogy. They include Brady Hartsfield, the antagonist known as Mr Mercedes. Here Stephen King's horror skills do come into play and we get a very believable and fairly terrifying serial killer. We also meet Holly Gibney, a very intelligent but troubled and dysfunctional young woman. She ends up teaming up with Hodges to try and take down the killer. As the story progresses, we learn a bit more about Brady Hartsfield. We learn about his weird relationship with his mother, his cold-hearted lack of regard for anyone around him, and they build this classic serial killer monster. The story is great, but unlike many crime thrillers, it lacks that real twist at the end where suddenly everything comes together. That's just not Stephen King's writing style, and he doesn't even attempt it. I've heard King talk about how he writes loads of times. He just thinks, you know, what would the character do next? and he writes it as he thinks it would happen. He never really starts out with a beginning, a middle and an end that are already planned. The story kind of builds around him. That style of writing isn't really conducive to planning in a twist ahead of time. Instead, he keeps you reading with the strong character building, the pacing and the graphic detailing that he's known for. There are loads of action-packed scenes in here and a constant sense of dread as you're never really sure who is the hunter and who is the prey. Right from the off, Stephen King does lean in on some classic tropes from prime writers like Joe Nesbo. Things like the retired policeman who has to work outside the law to take down the killer, or the ragtag band of misfits that have to come together to fight back. Now there's nothing new here, but I did enjoy the ride. I really enjoyed this book and potentially the other two titles in the series even more so. They differ quite a bit from this first book, but they keep a lot of that action and fast pacing and it still feels like a cohesive trilogy once you put it together. If you haven't checked them out yet, I absolutely recommend you do. So that brings us to Joe Nesbo's In the Night House. Now I was drawn to this book by this awesome front cover. Just look at this old gothic house with the fire blazing all around it. That old telephone hanging down with blood dripping from the end. Really interesting, very Hitchcock. It just had me straight away and I knew I wanted to read it. This story unwinds around a protagonist confronting horrors that blur the lines between real and spectral. It starts weird and it gets weirder. The story kicks off with a young bullying school kid, our protagonist Richard, daring another child to make a prank phone call from a public phone. 
We then see the boy put the phone to his ear and his ear is quickly glued to that phone. Blood begins to seep out from the earpiece. It then slowly sucks the child into the earpiece and consumes him whole right in front of Richard's own eyes. Soon after, another child goes missing while spending time with Richard. Richard begins to be investigated by the local police as he becomes their chief suspect. It's never quite clear who believes Richard, as the stories that surround the disappearances sound so far-fetched that they just couldn't possibly be true. Or could they? Now you do have to bear with this story a little bit. It's split into two parts and the middle bit is a bit drawn out. And particularly as it has you questioning so many things that were made out to be true in the first part, you're never really sure where you stand and that can leave you feeling a little bit disengaged but I really recommend you stick with it to the end because that's when it all comes together. True to form, Joe Nesbo weaves this terrifying tapestry with his usual crime flair, bringing in the twists and suspense you'd expect from that style of writer. And that's when that final act really pulls everything in. And that's what really sets this one apart. You need to see it through to the end to get that closure when everything suddenly makes sense. Now I did wonder how these books would go down with people who usually read those writers as they're such a departure. And in fact, I was surprised how much criticism The Night House came under from general public reviews, but with lots of people saying they didn't quite finish the book or only made it two thirds of the way through. And I think they let themselves down a bit there, because as I say, that's when it all comes together. If you just read two thirds of the book, you'd have a very different experience to someone who finished it. Now, I actually think it might be worth going back and rereading it and picking up on some of the foreshadowing that I likely missed first time round. I bet it's packed full with little things that make so much more sense that the second read. Throughout the first two acts of this book, it leans in on some classic horror tropes, and I think actually takes direct inspiration from Stephen King. It feels like the protagonist is being hunted by it at points, as he's kind of drawn into this old gothic house. The horrors manifest themselves in all different ways. He has to return as an adult to his childhood horrors and face them once again. It really ticks all those boxes. And when the telephone eats the small child at the start of the book, it actually reminded me of a Stephen King short story from the Bazaar of Bad Dreams, where a car eats people in a very similar way. The graphic, detailed writing of an inanimate object eating someone is so similar in both books. It really owes a lot to those classic Stephen King books, but I don't think it's ripping anything off, more paying homage. It's a good book, and if you want a bit of light horror with maybe a bit more substance to it, then this could be a great one for you. Both King and Nesbo managed to take their renowned storytelling skills into new genres without losing their touch, and I think that their key elements and writing styles remain intact. Like King's rich character arcs and Joe Nesbo's twist endings, I think this will likely please long-term fans but also draw in new ones. They both remind us that great writers are not confined to a single genre. These successful ventures into new literary territories show us the power of creative growth and exploration. So maybe bookstores should move authors out of the horror or crime thriller sections and just put them into fiction. I don't know, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video, a like would be appreciated and a sub to the channel would be amazing. See you next time. Thank you very much. Goodbye.